Good afternoon. I am Samantha Motts, an undergrad from the Georgia Institute of Technology. This summer, I had the pleasure to work with PhD, PhD student Sarah Warricks, Dr. Alexis Navar Sichler, and Dr. Kamni Singa from the Colorado School of Mines. I spent this summer examining the influence of topography on hydrology in the Hotel Gulch watershed, located in central Colorado. Overall, the project deals with several variables in terms of topography and hydrology. Therefore, our first, first order of business will be to define some of these variables. Then I will present the watershed, its location, and a bit of geology. We will then get into the nitty gritty of our objective of studying here, the methods we used, and our main questions. Afterwards, we will see some results from comparing the topographic data to the hydraulic data. And utilizing our results, we'll move into a brief interpretation and what that means for future studies after which we will shift to closing remarks and the implications of this work. But before we begin, you may be wondering why you should care. Well, the climate and hydraulic cycles are intertwined, as you can see with this photo, with a thunderstorm rolling in, forcing us to hike out of our watershed. With this in mind, one of the greatest challenges posed to humans during the water, well, during climate change, is a increased demand for water due to rising temperatures. Therefore, the need to comprehend our water system's inner workings continues to grow in importance. In a watershed, topography plays a key role um, in hydrology, as topography is inherently unique across space and time. The dynamics of how topography can influence a watershed remains pretty uncertain. Now onto our topographic variables, with slope, which are slope, aspect, curvature, upstream area, and topographic wetness index. Without getting into too much detail, I'll explain these very briefly. The slope is the rate of change in elevation seen in figure A. The aspect signifies the direction which the slope is facing, which is uh, with its signif significance hinted in figure B. Curvature is a bit of an odd one. Essentially, it pieces together the pixels of a map to make a more realistic surface as seen in figure C, with the valleys relating to concave and convex. These three calculations sum up runoff water quantitatively in terms of quantity, direction, and acceleration. Upstream area is the surface area that contributes to the flow at a well. This also signifies the surface area of our subcatchments, which you can see here on the right, subcatchment eight is circled. The topographic wetness index is the natural log of contributing area of retention to slope. This is a predictor of where water is accumulating and can help predict flooding. On the right, you see our watershed with the topographic wetness index raster generated from a three by three meter digital elevation model or DEM in ArcGIS Pro. The blue indicates where there's more wetness with our stream having the darkest colors of blue. On to the hydrology side, stilling wells take measurements of the surface water and can be seen along with the groundwater on the on well on the left, on the right, outwards. And this is our stilling well in the stream. And it's a little bit hard to see, but this is a groundwater well right next to the stream. A catchment is defined as the collection of rainfall over a drainage area, as seen in figure D. For scaling purposes in this project, we consider Hotel Gulch a single catchment, but divide into subcatchments to differentiate the contributing area per site. In this study, we look at two hydraulic measurements, the first of which is discharge, or the volume of water passing through a point over time, seen in figure E. And secondly, we focus on specific conductivity, which is the ability of water to conduct electrical current. So a high specific conductivity signifies a higher concentration of dissolved solutes in the water. This is our field site, the Holtzell Gulch watershed. It's located in the Manitou Experimental Forest, which resides in the southern part of Colorado's Front Range, about 60 kilometers northwest of Colorado Springs. Um, in our watershed, we have eight sites with one stilling well at each site. Additionally, you can see the subcatchments we divide the watershed into. Um, all all upper, upper, well, all lower subcatchments include upper subcatchments with exception of site four because it's a tributary. So for example, subcatchment two starts here, but it includes three through eight. So it's this entire area. Subcatchment four is isolated and then subcatchment five is five, but also six through eight. Topography and geology are heavily intertwined. So geologically, the Hotel Gulch watershed resides on the pa Pikes Peak Bathlet, also known as granite. It's also notable that there's a fault from the Mount Deception Fault System that goes in between sites one and two, as seen right here. Um, its location is not certain. Its influence is something we are unsure of, and we hope to figure out from future studies. So while the Manitou Experimental Forest is well-researched, the Hotel Gulch is not well-researched. Therefore, our objective is to develop a better understanding of flow and water chemistry in the Hotel Gulch watershed, both in its origins and how it may differentiate with climate change. This is a huge question to answer, and it's really the focus of Sarah Warwick's dissertation. 
my part in this large project was to see how the topography influences hydrology in the Holtz Out Gulch watershed. So to do this, I plotted well locations on a digital elevation model or DEM in ArcGIS Pro software from Global Positioning System or GPS coordinates collected in the field. I used a Trimble Geo 7X GPS unit as seen right here to collect coordinates. Um, then I performed a series of topography based calculations for the sites and the subcatchments of those sites. Um, my calculations included the variables we discussed, slope, aspect, curvature, upstream area, and topographic wetness index. The hydraulic data consists of discharge and specific conductivity collected in the stilling wells at the eight sites by Sarah Warrix. The general idea is that the influence of topography is highly prevalent in other watersheds. Therefore, from our understanding, topography must too play a key role in this watershed. Overall, we were very unsure what story these data would tell us because topography is just very unique. But our main questions remained, does a steep slope correlate to a lower standard deviation of discharge and a higher standard deviation of specific conductivity in the surface water? And how does an increasing upstream area influence specific conductivity? And if it wants to go, there we go. Maybe not too surprisingly, this project ended with multitudes of plots and data. So the first of what you were seeing here is our individual sites moving means for discharge over the experiment's duration from April to July, along with their slope intercept formulas displayed. Overall, we see a general decrease of discharge over time for most sites, except for site two, which highlights itself as an outlier. Additionally, I'll point out site one, which has the smoothest mean for discharge, not seen in any other graphs, making an outlier as well. The interactions between sites one and two will be will be brought up and will bring up some interesting questions that we will discuss in a little bit. Then we have our individual sites moving mean for specific conductivity over the same time period. Generally, we see an increase across sites, and with first assumptions, you believe what starts at the top of the stream should come down to the bottom of the stream, but it turns out stream dynamics are a little bit more complicated. Some of these changes we are seeing can be explained by other factors, but sites one and two stand out again as their conductivities jump from the previous sites. Site one again has this oddly smoothed mean that we don't see anywhere else. But before we jump into too much detail, the aid of a few other graphs led me to group together these sites to make sense of some of these correlations. Therefore, sites 1, 4, 6, 7, and 8 group together, and sites 2, 3, and 5 are grouped together. The evidence may seem a little unclear here for these groupings, but they'll make sense when we once we add the topographic parameters. And instead of boring you with hundreds of plots of topographic parameters, We'll cut to the chase with our two key topographic calculations. Out of all the slope calculations I performed, the average slope within a 100 meter radius of the staling well turned out to be the most informative. Here it is compared next to the topographic wetness index, and you can see how similarly these points plot, with few exceptions. With our groupings highlighted once more, we can begin to see the correlations and go back to our initial questions, which were in regards to the influence of slope and upstream area on the hydraulic aspects in the Holtel Gulch watershed. The topographic wetness index combines both of these topographic factors and connects well into our hydraulic data. When comparing the slope graph, we can see the prominent influence slope has on topographic wetness index and how it may influence our hydraulic parameters. Here we have the range of discharge and specific conductivity versus topographic wetness index. While these graphs don't display a perfect relationship, we do see these general positive and negative relationships. However, we should note that site one doesn't fall into this well, and that's because it's downstream from a fault. Um, so it should be continued to be noted as an outlier. And we also see these great examples of sites one, well, three and five, um, and how a high topographic wetness index correlates to a higher standard deviation discharge and a lower standard deviation in specific conductivity, with the inverses being true for sites seven and eight. Back to our groupings. The lower standard deviation in discharge and increased standard deviation in specific conductivity group together sites one, four, six, seven, and eight. Additionally, these same sites have lower topographic wetness index at their wells. In contrast, sites two, three, and five have increased standard deviation discharge and a lower standard deviation specific conductivity. These sites also have higher topographic wetness values at their wells. With that and a few other graphs, we saw this correlation between discharge and specific conductivity data sets along with the topographic wetness index. The increased topographic wetness index signifies that more water is accumulating at a specified site. In the cases of heavy rain, these sites would be flooding, creating a greater quantity of discharge and a mixture of specific conductivity from older surface water and newer precipitated water, making sense of these correlations. 
But back to our original questions, we saw a higher slope value would lead to the lower topographic wetness index value. And we know that an increased upstream area would lead to a higher topographic wetness index value. Additionally, this study helps to find early outliers and additional questions that need to be answered in order to fully understand the watershed. These data sets suggest differences in the interaction of the hydraulic systems of sites one and two. A fault residing between the two sites and field observations of the stream drying in between sites lead to potential hypotheses. But it could also be the influences of groundwater leading to the need for future studies in this area. And therefore, the slope and upstream area proved to be influences of discharge and specific conductivity through the topographic wetness index. Additionally, we are left with many more questions, as science typically goes. Research on the influence of the Mount Deception Fault System, groundwater interactions, additional water and soil chemistry are needed in order to fully understand the full picture of the Holtzell Gold watershed. However, we now have a better understanding of how the topography plays a role in this area, and this work will be continued to be built upon in future studies. And I just want to acknowledge that the Manitou Experiments Forest is the traditional territories of the Chennai and Uit peoples. Additionally, I wanted to thank NSF, the Inofco staff, and CU for making the summer happen somewhat in person, and the countless of amazing people that helped me along the way, Dr. Kamni Singa and Dr. Alexis Navar Sichler, my research mentors this summer. This project would not be possible without Sarah Warrix, and of course, my fellow undergrad in the field, Sadie Johnson, as well as my writing guru, Sierra Asmodo. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions. Great job, Sam. Um, so yep, if you have questions, you can unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat. Lon, you have a question. Yeah, so Sam, you were um, saying that uh, the fault is something that is a real variable there and it's an, uh, a subject for future research. Um, can you just sketch in a little bit what your plan would be for how you would um, actualize that research to pin down the influence of the fall? Yeah, thank you, Lon. Um, so there was a paper that I was reading just recently uh, that was talking about how they were doing a making a borehole to put in monitoring and loggers to see the well to monitor the water levels, but also um, to test the water chemistry. Um, and we are currently getting well, Sarah Warks is currently doing the water chemistry. And so um, comparing those two data sets would be interesting and also we would need to figure out where the fault is because it's still unclear. So um, a little bit of geophysics involved in there too. Great, thank you. Great job, Sam. We've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Heather McDonald asked, when you think back to the overall experience, what was the most interesting or surprising part of the summer work? That's a great question, thank you. Um, Whew. I think just how intense field work was going to be. Um, I don't think I was mentally prepared for it, um, but it was definitely very interesting to see how these group of scientists come together and problem solve in the moment. Um, and generally just how extensive hydrology is as a subject, I think would be the most interesting thing. Thank you. Great. And then uh, Christine asked, um, how prominent is that fall and are there any wells nearby? And by prominent, I mean, is there a scarp? That I'm unsure of. Um, its location isn't certain, so I don't think it's prominent at all. Um, the only reason we know is from looking at geological maps, uh, which say they're not certain of the location. Um, and it resides in between wells one and two. Um, and there's some drying in between those two sites. So there's speculation of if that may be um, related. Okay, great job, Sam. Um, if you have further questions, oh, one more question from Christine. How deep are the wells? Well, so the wells we are getting our data from are the stilling wells. And I'm actually not sure the 
depth. Um, the groundwater wells, I do know the depth. They're between one and two meters. Um, stilling wells, they're just measuring the surface water. So the depth, I don't think is as important. 